last garden destination on our grand tour is the entrance gardens. Pull it up on my screen as well. This wraps around our property from Andrews Drive to West Paces, where our main entrance is, all the way around to Veterans Park and Slayton Drive. This particular section shown here is the renovation in front of McElreath Hall. We have many different buildings on campus from the brutalist architecture here to very modern curves and glass on the museum. What I wanted to do with this landscape is put together a cohesive landscape across all of our entrances that suits the architecture, is attractive, and also supports our local ecosystem, a garden that you would expect to recognize some of the plants in the Atlanta area. So that means gardening with primarily natives, without synthetic chemicals, with boatloads of compost, and having some design elements that are repeated across that range to make it cohesive. This design style is informed by the new perennial movement, an aesthetic that draws on a naturalistic meadow appearance, but it's, it's idealized in, in terms of its flowers and its form. The style has been made very popular and it's not really new per se. Its most famous champion is Pete Aldolf in his work at the Lurie Garden in Chicago or the High Line in New York. One design element that I repeat um, in this garden is using clipped trees and shrubs for structure, particularly as a strong geometric form. So in this location, it's the 12 foot tall hornbeam hedge that I've put in against the building. Those are actually five individual trees that we've pruned into that shape to create that effect. This provides a sharp line and a foil to the softer, broad and naturalistic perennial planting that moves in and around these more static shapes. In this side, you can see where I've used Yopon holly and a clipped ball form in three different sizes. And I've threaded Mexican feather grass throughout that to wave around with its soft texture. There's also cone flowers in here and Achillea. And that's in our bus parking lot. No reason that can't be beautiful as well as functional. Up here at the main entrance, this is where Brash Coffee and Super Jenny are located. This is where the garden really comes into its own. The beds are deeper, there's more space here, and it's quite a large installation. There were over 10,000 perennials that we planted in this landscape up front. Another aspect of this style of design is using large drifts of perennials, groups of 15 to 60 of a kind. I have 600 of one kind of grass in this garden and you weave them in and out of each other, repeating some plants in that garden throughout so that you have a, a sense of rhythm, a rhythm that carries through. Another piece like that plant I mentioned we have 600 of is purple love grass or Aragrostis spectabilis. It's a native grass and it creates a frothy, foamy bloom only about 12 inches to 18 inches. That's called a matrix plant in this style of garden and you spread it out over a large area and then you can come back in with your more decorative perennials and plant them inside that matrix of grasses to provide you the textural contrast and a, a cohesive thread throughout the planting. It also layers the planting. So some plants grow low and wide and others are dotted in, rising up either in groups or scattered as if they were just seated around. Next slide. This is the longest, sorry, Catherine, back one. I went too fast. This is the longest bed in the garden in front of the Texas locomotive, and it shows an unusual plant called Monarda punctata. This is a native perennial. It's highly decorative with whorls of lavender flowers that then drop off, and they leave these green ping pong ball seed pods that last the rest of the year. And this is key to this style of gardening. You really have to shift gears if you're thinking of a gardening in an English aesthetic to gardening in this style. Here, we don't cut plants down or deadhead them after they finish flowering. I selected plants specifically for how they senesce into fall and winter. So in other words, do they die well? Do they have upright stems? Do they have interesting seed pods? Do they have good fall color? These are all just as important as the flower in this style of gardening. Because you're not deadheading, you're not tidying up all year. You're letting plants do what they do naturally. And we're learning and training our own eyes as well as our visitors and Buckhead in Atlanta that there is another style of garden design out there 
It's a more naturalistic style and it's a more ecological style of gardening. Let's go to the next slide now. This is a mix of plants that are in flower right now in front of the cyclorama. This photo demonstrates another aspect of this kind of design. You're not always choosing plants for how the colors look together, although this I think came out nicely. What I was going for was the contrast of flower forms. So I have these spires of the blue Agastache, blue fortune. And then I have the cone flowers with that bright orange cone and the drooping pink ray petals. And then daisy shapes on that dark purple Vernonia or the ping pong white ball forms of Rattlesnake Master. And you can see some of those forms repeating throughout. And in the back with the big pink corums of flowers is Joe Pie Weed. And I love talking about the native plants in this garden because so many of them go by such and such weed. Why are they called weeds? They're beautiful, they're native. And the reason why is because all of these plants were named as colonists came over here and looked at this flora through a European lens. So that was Jopai weed. And we have many other, other plants as examples that are called weed, but I think you can just call it Jopai. It's native, it has a right to be here. It's not a weed and it's very ornamental and a huge pollinator magnet. Next slide. Coneflowers I, I used throughout this whole landscape. I love coneflowers. Goldfinches love coneflowers. So do bees and butterflies. There's, there's a lot to love here. They have broad textured coarse green foliage that contrasts really nicely with grasses or fine textured plants in full sun. And then those cones look like little spiny hedgehogs in fall and winter. They turn dark brown or black and goldfinches come and pull the seeds out of them. So you get these beautiful bright yellow birds coming to visit. And they're already um, being spotted out in the gardens now. But that's one of those plants that dies really well. So you get nice green leaves in spring, a beautiful flower in summer, attracting pollinators. It's native here. And then that strong stem and they will fade to these, those black orbs. And those are very decorative and fall and winter when you have a lot of asters and grasses and other things. And then this little uh, dot of black throughout the landscape. Next slide. So this style of gardening, cone flowers, liatris, panic grasses, these are not revolutionary, but I really do want to encourage nurserymen and gardeners, master gardeners, horticulturists, everyone to look at a broader range of species that we can grow as ornamental plants in our landscapes that are also native. This is Allium sarnuum or nodding onion. It is a favorite of bees, has a lot of nectar to provide, and has a beautiful bright white flower which shows up really well in the evening. And I've just mixed it in here with that purple love grass, the Aragrostis underneath it and it's been in bloom for weeks and as a real highlight it's very pretty in person I think better than in this photograph but that's just not one that you'll find at the nursery so you have to really look for specialty native plant growers to get these plants out there. My dream my hope is that people will visit this garden see these plants and start creating a demand for them at their local garden center. Next slide. This gives you a little bit of the atmospheric effect of this garden. When the light is low and slanting through these gardens, it's really beautiful. And you get an idea of what those cone flowers look like. There is just a haze of calament or uh, calamenta nepeta, variety nepeta, which is white. It's going to flower for about five months. It just goes and goes and goes. It needs full sun, well-drained soil. The only thing I know that kills it is a really wet, soggy winter. So um, that's just another kind of long view of that central bed in the garden. And the last one of the garden pictures that we're going to look at. Next slide. So the last thing I want to share with you is this crazy idea that I had about February 2017. There was a large white oak that was in decline and I was really sad to take it down. I wanted to do something with it, honor its long life. It was about 140 years old. So I wanted to do something cool with it and we desperately needed more seating around Goizueta Gardens. So I, did try, I decided to try and make it into an enormous table in its tree form as if you slid it from branch tips down to root flare and laid it down. I already had the perfect spot because I wanted to not plant under these mature trees and entrance gardens. This is right behind 
that billowing landscape protected with two sculptural serpentine and evergreen hedges. So you're, you're boxed into this space and protected from West Paces, which is just on the other side. And this, uh, this is the, the end result I'm showing a picture of here, but we took the tree down in eight to 10 foot sections. We had advisors, we sealed the ends so it wouldn't dry too fast and reduce cracking and then took it to a local sawmill owner and had it planed into two and three inch slabs. We then stacked it up for two years in our parking deck and let it dry. We had a lot of patience with this project. We finally got it down to about a 14% soil moisture, sorry, wood moisture content. Luckily for us, uh, next slide there, Catherine, local expert woodworker Kirk McAlpin III was willing to take on this complicated project. So we inventoried, we measured each piece, and I began the design of the table. I had templates made of the larger slabs to use as tabletops, of which there are 15 in all. And these were useful in laying out the design up there on that site because I needed it to thread between the existing trees that were in that location and, and change the angles of how it would branch in order to accommodate more seating. Kirk began the enormous undertaking of bringing that raw lumber to life over a period of seven months. Together we fine-tuned that table design as he progressed, adjusting angles and edges based on the conditions of each piece as he went. Each piece was hand planed, shaped, repeatedly sanded and finished on all sides with numerous layers of an epoxy resin and varnish that is used in boat building. And here you can also see the bow ties that are used uh, and crafted in there so that the wood cannot crack any further as it expands and contracts in the weather. The next slide will show you the quality of that finish. It is glossy and gorgeous. In total, there were 36 slabs of oak utilized and finished to, to a very high quality. The entire tree table is made from that one white oak that we had to take down. One tabletop, in fact, shows the decay inside the tree. It's a very dark stain where it just kept soaking in more and more of the epoxy resin into that softened wood. Then there were all of the benches that we had to make and what I wanted to do was match the remaining pieces of lumber that we had from the tree as best as we could with the curves and angles around each of the tabletop species. Tabletop slab. So while Kirk worked his magic with the oak, um, I worked on the next step, which is the concept design of the table bases. I ended up favoring a weathering steel and what I learned is called a sled design. And this gives a stable flat base no need to dig through all these existing tree roots. It would have completely defeated the purpose if we'd had to put in a bunch of footings. This also gave us the ability to attach those benches to the table's structure for security and have a minimal appearance so the focus would really remain on the oak. A local fabricator called Fascinate was used to make the, to take those templates of each of those tabletop pieces and the benches, they took them to their shop and we fine tuned those dimensions to get them accurate for each unique table base. And finally, this is a view from the branch tips and looking back down the tree. The garden staff made these, we call them logettes, the tree stump seats, which accommodate seating needs where the branch angles were too tight for benches. We clean it every single day right outside where we have brash coffee and super jenny and the day we opened it, we had, we've had people there ever since, socially distanced and picnicking at the table. So all of this is open. You can walk right in off of West Paces and come see this. Um, the entrance is not far past that where you can show your ticket. If you'd like to explore the rest of Goizueta Gardens in real life, uh, we would love to see you.